still feeling pretty sick, so we're doing another video from the floor today. Hope you're feeling spooky, or at least very emotional, because today we are going to be talking about the queen of the gothic herself, the author of 18th century thrills, the one, the only, Anne Radcliffe. Even if you haven't heard of Radcliffe before, you've likely formed some idea of what a gothic novel is. Huge, pretty architecture, lots and lots of nature descriptions, and maybe even ghosts? Not in Radcliffe, though. Uh, in Radcliffe, the supernatural always has some rational explanation, even if it's that you're... Oh, by the way, spoilers. So many spoilers. And one of the major charms of this book is its ongoing mystery, so if you have any intention of reading it, I suggest you go do so and then return to this video. I'm serious, it's very, very fun to read when you have no idea what's going on. I was originally going to talk about Mysteries of Udolfo, but that shit is 800 pages long and it's final season, guys. So instead, we're going to be looking at The Romance of the Forest, and I don't regret my decision. I really enjoyed this book. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about one of the major themes of the book, which is what happens when men in power use that power to use and abuse women. And even though a lot of people know kind of what's going on, they don't really put a stop to it. Gee, I wonder how that could be relevant to today. Let's jump into the summary. All right, I think we're safe now. Goodbye forever, Paris. If only we could have seen our son before we left. I know, I know, but you really must be grateful that we managed to escape at all, considering my heinous crimes, which I won't elaborate on at the moment. Peter. Yes? Where are we going? I really don't know. I'm gonna go ask for directions from that cottage over there. They may know the way to the road. You guys stay here. Hello? Yeah, what do you want? Uh, can you give me directions to the road, please? Yeah, but I need you to take this girl with you. What? If you don't take her, I'll kill you. Oh, okay. Come with me then, dear. So, uh, got directions and also a crying pretty girl. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. Lamont, what are we going to do for shelter tonight? Why don't we check out that, uh, that tower up ahead? Oh, a ruined abbey. Peter, go scout it out. Yes, sir. Man, it is getting pretty late, huh? Yes, and it's so spooky here. I really don't like it at all. What's that noise? A ghost? Nope, just me. I found some, uh, some nice rooms that we could live in. All right, that settles it. Peter, you go to town and get us supplies to set up home here. And the rest of us will try and settle in. All right. While we're here, I will tell you my tragic backstory. My mother died when I was very young, and my father sent me to a convent. When I refused to become a nun, he gave me to that man who then gave me to you. Oh, that's a shorter story than I was expecting. Hey, I'm back! It turns out the people of the town think this abbey is haunted and won't go anywhere near it. They say someone was kidnapped and then murdered here. Ooh, how horrible. Hi! <gasps> Lewis! Hey, Mom, I'm really glad I found you guys. It, it's only because Peter is really bad at keeping his mouth shut. Peter? No, no, none of that. Lewis, we must go catch up. All right, Mom. Now I better start setting up the rooms. I think I'm going to go cry alone. Whew, I'm glad to have finally found a safe place. Hey, open up! <gasps> yes? This is my abbey. What do you think you're doing here? <gasps> you. I, I can explain. In private, please. Fine. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> My name's Theodore. I'm Adeline. All right. On these terms, I will let you stay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be seeing you later, Adeline. Come on, Theodore. What was that all about? Um, nothing. Say, Adeline, your, um, father, uh, is in the area I just found out. And, um, I don't have the power to protect you. If only there were someone very powerful, maybe an attractive older man who could save you. Yeah. Adeline. I'm madly in love with you. 
What? Marry me and my fortune will be yours. Oh, um, I don't think so. Kidnap it is then. Oh! <sighs> it had to be done. Settle in here at my chateau. In the morning, I'll have a totally legitimate priest come and totally marry us. Isn't your wife still alive? What? No. Just chill out for the night, okay? I'll be back in the morning. Love you. Oh, whatever am I going to do? Will the maid servants help me? No, they're all too enamored with the marquee. Oh, an unlocked window. Thank goodness. Adeline, I came to save you. Thank you, Theodore. Hey, that's my stolen damsel. I will never let you take her, even if you are my commanding officer. Ha! Oh, officers, arrest that man for attacking his commanding officer and take Adeline back to the abbey. No! What's this? Adeline seems to have dropped a letter. That seal. <gasps> Lamotte! Yes, sir? Tell me, what did you do to get into so much trouble in Paris? Well, I scammed people, sir. Oh, you did? Yes, they really don't want me back now. Well, I have it in with the king, and I think I could get you returned to court. If you'll do one little favor for me, anything, I want you to kill Adeline. Oh, yes, of course. Kill Adeline. Peter, get out of here. I can't do it. Adeline, wake up. You're in terrible danger. Peter is going to take you to his hometown of Savoy. Maybe there you will be safe. Aw, it's so cute how you think you have a conscience. Guard, seize this man. Arrest him for being a scammer in Paris. No! Now I've got to go find that dratted girl. Well, this is it. This is my hometown. It's called Leelancore. I hope you like it. Um, it seems pretty nice, sure. Peter, I, I don't feel so good. Oh, uh, Adeline? Adeline? Is everything all right, young man? Oh, Monsieur Leluc, thank goodness. Adeline is sick. Oh, Papa, we must take her in, mustn't we? Of course we must, my daughter. Hooray! I love doing good deeds! Oh, I'll just, uh, I'll just buck her off then. Thank you for taking care of me in my hour of need. It is my pleasure and my duty. Monsieur Leluc. Are you Monsieur Leluc? That's me. Your son Theodore has been arrested and awaits his execution. What? Wait, you're, you're Theodore's father? Yes. Let us all go to the prison together. Father, they're going to have me executed. Hey, good news, I think I just got you a reprieve. All we need is to have Adeline testify at my father's trial, because what happened to her directly impacts the character of the Marquis, and if the Marquis is shown to be kind of terrible, then maybe they'll let you go. Oh, thank goodness. Anything for my Theodore. All right, to the court. I testify that the Marquis kidnapped me and tried to force himself on me. And it was just terrible. I would like to make a testimony. What? I would like to testify that the Marquis hired me to dispose of Adeline. She is, in fact, his niece. The Marquis murdered his brother in the abbey and then sent his niece to go live at an abbey. A different abbey, not this one. One that has people living in it and stuff. Anyway, Adeline is the Marquise's niece, and the Marquise is a murderer! My reputation! I will drink poison, then confess that all is true, leaving Adeline the rightful heiress of her own fortune. And I will use my new good name to save my friends! I think I'm going back to prison, but meh. Oh, thank goodness! I can save them all. Lamotte, the king has given you a reprieve. He has given you banishment instead of execution. Here's some money to make you comfortable. Thank you, Adeline. Thank you. Theodore, 
Oh, my love, you're safe. Yes, I am. And now we can all go live in the middle of nowhere in Leland Corps. Hooray! Gothic novels are known for their obsession with old architecture and for the way that they hint at or even directly display elements of the supernatural. Radcliffe takes a bit of a different approach, however, as Nelson C. Smith writes in his article Sense, Sensibility and Radcliffe, Radcliffe's heroines are often susceptible young women whose terrors are usually the products of their own heightened imagination, and the cure, as Radcliffe makes clear, is a return to common sense. For this reason, anything that seems supernatural in Radcliffe, in fact, has a very mundane or human explanation. Readers at the time found this very frustrating. Smith quotes Walter Scott, who found that the way Radcliffe rationalizes away the supernatural in her books destroys a reader's solemnity of feeling and makes him feel that his sensations have been tricked. And Smith also quotes Howell, who said that he prefers uh, the speculations of Catherine Morland in Northanger Abbey to the fact of the novel. But Radcliffe isn't interested in ghosts and demons and ghouls. She's interested in evil. Real human evil. Her novels explore the psychology not just of fear, but of cruelty, betrayal, and despair. The danger posed to Adeline doesn't come from the ghost of the Abbey prisoner, but from the real flesh and blood man that murdered him. And evil doesn't come in the form of ghosts or demons, but in the form of powerful men like the Marquis, who do what they please, and of weak men like Lamotte, who do nothing to stop him. In The Romance of the Forest, Radcliffe shows us what happens when a young woman is at the mercy of an older and much more powerful man, and the danger posed to her when the people around him help him either explicitly by ensnaring and keeping her for him, or implicitly by turning a blind eye to what he's doing. Radcliffe makes it clear that people know what the Marquis is like, but he's either charming or powerful enough to get away with things like kidnapping and attempted rape. We see this in action in scenes like the one where Adeline is locked in the Marquis's chateau and begs the young woman attending her to help her, but all they do is go on and on about how wonderful the Marquis is, and how if Adeline isn't happy here, it'll be her own fault. Similarly, the physician tending to Theodore when he is wounded tells him that the Marquis's character is too well known to suffer him either to be respected or liked, and yet nobody stops him from doing whatever he pleases. Even Theodore knew his character when he came to spend time with him. He just came along anyway because he didn't want to offend his commanding officer. Honestly, this sounds a lot like stories surrounding figures like Harvey Weinstein, who everyone knows is acting inappropriately, yet no one does anything to stop. They may give his victims a nudge in the right direction, but that's about it. Other than that, everyone's just too afraid of how powerful he is, like Lamont in The Romance of the Forest, to speak out against what he's doing and take a stand. For Weinstein, the closest anyone came to calling him out publicly was when Seth MacFarlane made jokes about his sexual misconduct in the 2013 Oscars. In an interview with French television, Weinstein's chauffeur said that he drove around tearful, aspiring actresses after they had been assaulted by Weinstein and did his best to comfort them, but didn't really do anything else. And Quentin Tarantino said to the Times that he knew enough to do more than he did. And yet nothing happened until the survivors of his assault came forward. Then, it was like the floodgates were open. Everyone had a Harvey Weinstein story, and everyone would say he had a certain reputation in Hollywood. And yet, no one spoke up about it until the survivors came forward. Obviously, Harvey Weinstein isn't the only man in a position of power over a woman to treat her this way. We're starting to hear more and more stories as women finally feel they can speak up about their abuse without being crucified by the media. But if everyone knows what's happening, why is it always the victims that are the first to come forward? Why doesn't anyone speak up against it, shine a light on the situation? People like Weinstein can only operate when everyone around them is silent for fear of their power and their reputation. This theme has been especially prevalent in the books we've been looking at so far for this series. In Pamela, the protagonist is kidnapped and nearly raped repeatedly by her employer. 
in love and excess, Meliora must again and again rebuff sexual advances from her guardian, and in Romance of the Forest, Adeline is persecuted by the Marquis. In fact, this was the theme that drove me to create this series in the first place. I saw parallels between the treatment of these heroines and the treatment of women today. Sure, women today aren't usually kidnapped the way these heroines are, but they are still coerced by threat or force into unwanted sexual contact. And I think the solution here is similar to the solution offered in The Romance of the Forest. I'd like to include the other two books, but unfortunately both of those women end up marrying their would-be assaulters. If you know that a man in your office has a certain reputation, speak up about it. If one of your friends likes to push himself on women, call him out on it. Predators hunt in darkness, so bring them into the light.